My name is Anna Gallagher. I'm the executive director of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network Clinic. And I'm very pleased to moderate this last panel at the conference, a glass half full or half empty, humanitarian protection developments. So welcome and happy to see you all. Uh, and I'm now I'm pleased to pre present to you our panelists, each with deep and rich experience in the field of migration, asylum and refugee law, policy, practice, operations, as noted in their bios, which you have in the conference program. So at the end is Lawrence Bartlett, Director of Refugee Admissions, Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration, U.S. Department of State. Welcome, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you. And immediately to his left is Kit Tainter, Vice President of Policy and Practice at Welcome USA. Welcome, Kit. And in right to my right is Eskinder Nagash, President and CEO, U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, and welcome, Eskinder. Um, so before starting, I'm going to go back and forth um, and prompt questions to our panelists and have them respond to the questions. Um, but before starting, I just wanted to remind folks about what our speakers, some of our speakers said earlier today about the issues that our panelists will address. Attorney General Tong noted that immigration policy and the fact and experience of immigration are very personal for everyone. This affects real people. And certainly our three panelists know that and have experienced that uh, and, and with working with the populations they work with as well. Today's speakers spoke of seeing opportunities among the thousands of migrants and refugees arriving in the United States. They spoke of opportunities for our communities in receiving them. And again, this is precisely what our panelists do. They shared that the largest number of arrivals are coming from communist countries. Does that change the, change, change the state of play? They suggested that this is a time when we can more clearly explain what asylum is and why it is important. And they agreed on the importance of data-based evidence in preparing for reception and creating effective solutions. One of our speakers reminded us that welcoming large numbers of refugees is not a capacity issue for the global north. So with that in mind, our panel, panelists will continue to talk of opportunities and opportunities for change. They will examine how the refugee resettlement infrastructure is rebounding from major cuts where gaps continue and where opportunities exist to more robustly, effectively, and humanely welcome and receive those seeking protection and refuge in the United States. So our panelists are going to share um, their experiences for about 35 minutes, 40 minutes, after which we will reserve some time for questions from the audience, and we look forward to your questions. So with that, we'll start our discussion. Director Bartlett, could you give us a brief overview on refugee admissions for FY 2022, including the number admitted thus far and anticipated by the end of the year? Sure, let me, um, actually I want to take the word brief out of that because I actually want to do a little bit more if I can, <laughs> but um, let me know if I'm going on too long. So a couple of things, I want to read just up front a couple of the sentences that we prepared for Secretary Blinken as he was consulting with Congress last week, because I think they're really a powerful testimony of this administration's commitment to refugee resettlement. So um, it reads, the U.S. role as the world's largest humanitarian donor and resettlement country has always been an important marker of our leadership on the world stage. It reflects American generosity and the strong bipartisan commitment to and leading with our values. An integral part of that role has been our ability to welcome those who are persecuted abroad and give refuge and a new life to those fleeing crises around the world. So, you know, one of the questions, you know, is it half full, is it, is it um, half empty? Um, I would strongly propose that we are half full. Our program, um, I think, has once again been restored to solid footing. Um, our arrival numbers this year, the president authorized us, people who are familiar with our program know that the president has the prerogative year by year to um, indicate a number of re uh, refugees who can arrive. 
Our target this year was 125,000. We have fallen uh, woefully short of that. I think we will admit about 25,000 by the end of this September. Um, it is not, frankly, unexpected. I think there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the efforts of the last administration and certainly the very low ceilings that led to obviously a system that was pretty underpopulated and uh, under-resourced. So that I think has been uh, partially restored and it continues to be restored. It is certainly a high um, initiative of this administration. But the other thing that we can't forget, most of us sitting here without a mask on, is that we have all been affected by COVID for the last two and a half, three years. And refugees were the same. You know, we could not move people. We cannot move people to capital cities to process. So frankly, I would argue the impact of COVID um, was probably even a larger factor in our lower arrivals this year. We are, we, I will tell people, um, sometimes it's surprising when you look at our populations, the largest number of refugees as a nationality this year will be coming from the Congo. Um, but the second largest are Syrians, which I think is again, a really good um, note, um, given the policies of this administration really to have an open um, refugee program to, to all. And then Syrians are followed by Burmese, Sudanese, Afghans, who came in as refugees, not as parolees, Ukrainians, who also came in as refugees, and Guatemalans. So I think, again, you see from some of the nationalities that we're working with kind of a high impact and kind of a, a real uh, emphasis on those we're, we're working with. And then my last point um, maybe that I'll make is, and I think we can talk about this later, is in addition to the 25,000 that we're bringing, and Iskinder and others of my friends will argue that that's uh, woefully low, um, we all need to remember that you know this country, and I'm not gonna say this government, but this country and our people have brought 80, over 80,000 Afghans to this country, not as refugees this year, but as parolees. And um, we have about 90,000 Ukrainians who, are, who have apl applied for parole and have been granted it. They have not all yet arrived. I think we have about 55,000 Ukrainians arriving under parole so far. So the, the, the lift, I think, that this administration and, and frankly our people and our communities have experienced over the last year is frankly way beyond 125,000. So I think I will leave it at that. Thank you, Director Bartlin. And, and could you... Um share a little bit how the responses to the displacement crisis this past year are different from other humanitarian crises? So I think that obviously leads to Afghans and Ukrainians, which, so I've been in this business for, I don't know, maybe 15,000 years, 15,000. <laughs> it, it only seems like that some days, um, 15 years. And I think this is the first year that I've seen an administration that has been so kind of adept and nimble at looking for alternate pathways to bring people to the US. And, and I heard a little bit of Governor Hutchison's um, speech before, and but, Looking at the refugee program for what it is, it's it's amazing. It's a great tool. You know, it has security checks. It has you know great um, anchoring and integration aspects on the back end once people arrive. You know, legal status, both for Afghanistan because of course the evacuation was happening in real time with multiple planes a day coming into places like Qatar, um, and a need to to really keep people moving through the system it was quickly decided that people needed to be brought in under parole. And frankly, similar calculus was made for Ukrainians where trying to relieve some of the pressure on our European allies who were very generous hosts of Ukrainians and offer people an opportunity to come to the US. But again, with some kind of a, a ability to be anchored. And so, and this was a program that was put together by DHS, really allowed people to come in who had sponsorship so they could come in with support, but support from their sponsors, and then apply for parole once they arrive. So they're more temporary, and we know some of the problems that the Afghan program uh, now will have in the sense of people making an adjustment to some kind of a permanent status. But they were very conscious decisions made for the kind of extreme environment in which we found ourselves. And again, if we would have waited for the refugee program, 
Not that it's not wonderful and amazing, but it would have taken far longer and we wouldn't have been able to accomplish what we did. Mm -hmm. And frankly, our resettlement partners have in fact played a leading role in all three of those things. So just the resettlement program itself, but the Afghan program and the Ukrainian program, um, everybody can still access ORR benefits. Um, PRM put in special measures for Afghan. So people have on the temporary kind of support side received a lot of the same services, but now the question will be um, some, what, what will be their status on a permanent basis? Thank you. And then um, Mr. Nagash, could you share your thoughts uh, on the displacement crises in the past year and sure, how they're different? Sure. Uh, Larry was in preschool when this happened, so <laughs> he doesn't remember, but uh, 1975 and 1978, we did actually bring in a lot of people from Vietnam. Uh, some of them actually stayed in military base in California, in Arkansas, uh, in other places. So this is not the first time that we have, you know, accepted people without going through the process. So if I'm not mistaken, I know there's a lot of people here, experts, and who have written on this issue. 1975 was the Vietnamese and Laos and, and Cambodia. Uh, that was really not really the your typical refugee processing that, that we have now. So we have done that. And then if I'm not mistaken, we did also the same thing with Bosnians. Uh, and then you know we processed them. It was a military base, and then prior and then next to that, I think we have done was Kurd, uh, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in Guam. Also, we processed them. So there is some history of you know accepting this emergency resettlement and different models. And then of course, some of you remember we had 100,000 Cubans who came in also mm. before that, even though it's a different process again. So we have. We have done this kind of emergency uh, decision to bring in people to the U.S., but this is probably the largest, uh, you know, humanitarian response to the Afghans uh, in, t in terms of 80,000. Uh, the refugee resettlement agencies we resettle about 80,000 refugees from August to February 15. So within five months, you know, that we did this resettlement. So it is. It is something, you know, I think the resettlement agents are quite proud. And then I think State Department did a lot of, uh, you know, creative ways to make sure that. Uh, so the uh, creative ways uh, to resettle them. So I'm happy to tell you that even my agency, we have resettled about 10,000 refugee uh, Afghans uh, in addition to the other refugees who's come into the country. Thank you, Mr. Nagash. Ms. Tainter, do you have any thoughts on the... Um responses to, to the display, displacement crisis this past year? Yeah, I want to highlight um, something that Larry said a little bit earlier is that, you know, this is a glass half full situation. Like there's been a lot that's been done over the past year. Skinner just talked about, you know, the 80,000 Afghan evacuees, 10,000 of them through USCRI that have been um, resettled. And that is amazing. That is a lot of folks that are finding their path here in our local communities that are integrating and that are learning how to thrive. Like I am super excited about all the work that's been, been done, but I'm excited about it because it's been done and I'm excited because it shows what's possible. So the Department of State, um, has done a lot of innovation um, through oper Operations Allies Welcome over the past, you know, 12 months or so um, to include drawing in new partners to the act of welcoming, which I think is really important. And so, um, you know, there's been different institutional partners that have partnered with resettlement agencies with the Department of State um, to welcome um, Afghans in. That includes groups like Samaritan's Purse, like the Lions Club, like Islamic Relief USA. So organizations that oftentimes have a humanitarian bent, but haven't necessarily been involved in refugee resettlement here in the United States. And that is great um, that we have these, these iconic and differently politically situated organizations really stepping in and saying, hey, I want to be part of this. I want to be part of the welcoming of Afghans. You know, the other group that has stepped in to welcome Afghans and Ukrainians is Everyday Americans, which is incredible. You know, so we have, you know, a number of, you know, and kind of piloted through the Department the state, private sponsorship groups that stood up everywhere from Iowa to South Carolina and said, you know what, I'm really touched by this. I, you know, I'm a veteran. Um, I, you know, moved by my faith, all sorts of different reasons that people stood up and said, you know what, I want to welcome an Afghan into my community. I want to welcome an Afghan as part of my family, and I want to help this Afghan thrive. And we've seen the same thing happen for Ukrainians. So over 100 and, you know, 20,000 or so everyday Americans have raised their hand and said, I want to participate in these acts of welcoming. You know, the uh, United States 
States government has made it possible for these groups and these individuals to participate, and we've taken advantage of it. And it's really incredible to see, you know, 200, a, com a commitment from the administration for 200,000 newcomers to come in through parole and to be welcomed in, into our communities and be welcomed through traditional partners like USCRI that Us Skinder represents and new partners like Lions or like um, Samaritan's Purse. And so it's really taken a whole of society approach um, to welcoming over the past year, which makes me really excited. Um, somebody who comes from wearing two, you know, I've worn a couple of different hats in my professional life to include on sort of the more immigrant integration and the refugee resettlement um, kind of different paths. And it really makes me excited to see that these opportunities have been laid out um, for folks to get involved from all walks of life and welcoming folks, um, welcoming folks with different immigration statuses, but also really welcoming folks into the fabric of local communities where integration really happens. And so there's, there's a lot to celebrate, I think, over the past year and, and a lot to celebrate in innovation. And I feel like immigrant policy and innovation are not words that are used in the same sentence quite often. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a moment in which we can say, you know, DHS and DOS, they have really leaned in with innovation over the past 12 months and made some incredible things happen, um, not only for, you know, the di diaspora communities that are here, for our veterans communities, but really um, for our communities of our international partners abroad um, who deserve our allyship. Thank you, Ms. Tainter. And just thinking, following up on you saying, um, that we've expanded to new and different partners. Um, and it seems, you know, we've heard today that personal stories matter, that people become supportive and join together as communities to welcome people that are different than them. And would you say that this, do you believe this trend will continue? Or how can we, um, how can we uh, create a structure or solutions to, to expand this? I mean, it's such a great question. I mean, I think that, um, you know, those of us that have been involved in immigrant integration work for a long time understand that it's really rooted in those personal stories, like your speaker earlier today talked about, you know, once you um, sort of interact and get to know a newcomer, you really become moved um, by not only their story, but their resiliency and their confidence and the potential that lies the potential that lies in the opportunities ahead for them. You know, Welcome.us um, is a new nonprofit initiative. We were stood up um, last September. It's our year anniversary last year. We were conceived of before the Afghan evacuation, but we operationalized soon afterwards. And we're basically founded on the belief that everyday Americans can be inspired and energized to welcome newcomers if they're invited to be part of it. And so really, instead of coming through kind of the political angle to think that, you know, immigrant, you know, immigration policy is broken, which it is, right? It, we all know that that is true. But instead of coming at it from a political angle, how can we come to it from a service angle and recognize that we are a compassionate country, that we are a country made up of, of folks that really want to serve their local communities? And how do we open those doors so that everyday Americans can participate in welcoming, can be moved in the way that we've been moved, and can begin to change um, their perspective on what immigrants and immigration policy should look like? And so we, I do think this is a you know historic moment in which mm -hmm. you know you've got folks. There's a great sponsor story that we have from, I forget the name of it, but it's some small town in South Carolina. And it's a story about somebody who saw it on the news and said, what can I do? And found out what they could do. And now they have a whole community rallying around an Afghan newcomer. And this is this is a community that would not have interacted with this Afghan newcomer were there mm -hmm. not these new programs. Um, you know, oftentimes our newcomers come to large cities where it can be easy to be anonymous, but in small cities and rural communities across the United States, there's, you know, families, there's bridge clubs, there's churches mm -hmm. um, figuring out how to welcome. And then they've got somebody in their community who they believe in and they understand their story and they can get committed to their journey. Thank you. And it's, it's clear that these arrivals have pro provided opportunities for communities to come together and, and, um, and show their big hearts and their compassion. So thank you. So uh, moving on to, to the next question. So given the, the challenges in the asylum processes, we heard about that today, backlogs, um, legal representation challenges, et cetera, the time it takes for refugee resettlement and um, the arrival of future large populations, such as Ukrainians, Afghans. Um, what, uh, given these ongoing challenges, what, what might be the implications for our system of humanitarian protection? We'll start with Mr. Uh, we'll uh, Director start Barthel. On the we'll start on the end and we'll go through. Mm -hmm. um, so what's interesting to me is that, I mean, everything that Kent, Kitts had just said was is like so true. I mean, we have to build, you know, a community 
a community of communities, mm. right, that believe and value others, um, no matter their status. So, you know, one of the things that I like about directing the refugee program is it's rather defined and, um, and I would have thought everybody would have loved it, but I turned out that wasn't true um, <laughs> in the kind of little recent past. But the refugee program, you know, the, the many things going for it, and one is that when people come here, they actually have a pathway to permanent uh, citizenship and benefits to help them achieve that, right? And to become employed, to become self-sufficient, really to integrate into communities. And, and it comes with a whole bunch of security checks that, you know, people may love or not, but but I think most of us in the program understand how those checks have really safeguarded the program from those people who would find fault in the people we're bringing here, including Afghans for that matter. So to me, that program is a great anchor um, that, that we build on. And so again, you know, we will be building this year and perhaps next to get to 125,000 under this administration. We'll have to see you know, obviously that's malleable in terms of new administrations, but trying to build that foundation, I think with what Kit talked about, trying to build community support so that people don't see this as a scary thing, but they see it as really a positive thing. Employers, um, you know, elected officials at the local level, frankly, for the most part, really love this program. But I think the other, you know, the other things that we've talked about, and, and thank you, Eskinder, for reminding me that I'm too young to remember some of these other past incidents. Um, also, I think we need to build kind of an understanding for how those programs really complement other things that we're doing. So I, I really see these, these things as really op opportunities, and I know that there's a lot of discussion within this administration for figuring out how do we build on the successes that we've had over this past year? I mean, how do we build on the tremendous support from our veterans communities, you know, because it's not so hard to move from Afghans to the next population. Um, and I think, you know, again, Kit has talked about some of the um, partners that we've developed and that we've funded, but also that they've self-funded to come out and be part of this, this response. And I think that's something that we have really doubled down on and, you know, welcome.us and others are really helping us kind of galvanize some of that support. So I'm not sure if I really answered it, but mm. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And Mr. Nagash? Uh, again, I think uh, we need to remind ourselves from time to time, the refugee resettlement program in this country since 1980, uh, if my information is correct, we have resettled 3.4 million refugees. Uh, going back, I'm not even counting you know, what happened 1975 to 1980. So we have resettled 3.4, 3.5 million and refugee resettlement in, in, in this country is a public-private partnership. So every refugee resettlement we had, and, and going back to um, Hungarian refugees who came in in 1956, is always a community engagement. I think what's new is from time to time we have to remind ourselves uh, that, that we have the community support, but we have to engage them, as, as she mentioned. Uh, keep in mind, you know, the, uh, the, the refugee resettlement program in this country has been uh, uh, federally funded uh, maybe in 1970. Prior to that, refugee resettlement in this country happened at the community level, not at the mm. state level, not the federal level. So we have to get a little bit of historical perspective when we see in terms of what kind of re refugee resettlement we'll be doing in the future. Like anything else, after a while, the system has to be revisited you know, to see if it's really modern or effective. We have the Refugee Act uh, maybe reauthorized re maybe once, but we have a long, long way of looking at it and, and looking at in terms of the refugee resettlement, the, the current situation we have. You know, what happened in Ukraine, what happened in Afghanistan is different. I mean, our government reacted, reacted fast. But if you look at also refugee res resettlement previously, most of the refugee resettlement we did is post-U.S. government conflict. Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Laos, whether it's Somalia, it was other countries, whether it's Iraqi refugees, now it's Afghan refugees. So 
there is a lot of work we have to do. As much as you know, we did a great job in terms of welcoming Afghan, welcoming uh, um, and Ukrainian. Uh, we have a long way also to be inclusive of other other uh, asylum seekers. You know, as as we welcome thousands of Ukrainian. At the same time, you know, we were also not considering other refugees from Haiti and other places that they are coming to our country looking for asylum. So I think maybe going forward, as Kit mentioned, you know, when we start thinking community engagement, it has to be a very inclusive, you know, community engagement that we have to do with these refugees who are coming from El Salvador or or Guatemala or where they're they are coming from Afghanistan or DRC. So there is a lot of work we have to do, but I think we need to remind, you know, that we have done this refugee resettlement that is a modern refugee resettlement since the 1980 Refugee Act, that we have resettled millions of people and then millions of derivative beneficiaries who came to this country. So as we go forward, you know, using this model um, that, you know, the, the, re the reaction of the community when the uh, uh, Bosnian came to this country, there was a lot of, you know, support and the media play major roles. Uh, but when the uh, Congolese come, mm. uh, they're not going to get the same kind of reaction. So we have to take that into consideration, how we will be a welcoming community to all, not necessarily that, you know, what the media present to us, uh, the crisis. So um, sometimes I struggle as a refugee resentment person, and I have reset to the refugees. I came as myself as refugees. Sometimes we have to balance this selective humanity uh, which is, is is a challenge for us because you know you know there are about one million uh, hundred million refugees and IDPs in the world. Who we, we choose uh, and who comes to the U.S. is a very small fraction. So how can we have this very inclusive uh, policy of that taking all issues uh, into consideration as part of our resettlement model? And then how do we prepare? when we have refugees coming to this country, not necessarily from post-US conflict, like Afghanistan in 20 years on Ukraine, what happened with Russia. Um, that's something uh, that we have to work uh, uh, with, with uh, the larger community because refugees are not just what CNN and, and NBC uh, is telling us who refugees are and why we should be giving priorities to some of them. So I think the challenge for us, now, not necessarily for the government in terms of policy, is we, the resettlement agency, I represent over 40 resettlement agencies around the country. Uh, the average of these resettlement agencies are 90 years. And my organization had been doing refugee resettlement, doing advocacy work for 111 years. And, and the first time my agency got any funding to to provide refugee resettlement was in 1979. So you can see that we have done this with the community support, with the churches, with synagogues, with uh, mosques. You know, the resettlement has been always uh, involved uh, the community, but whether we are going to do it in an organized way with the help of KIT and uh, the new organization, uh, and I think we, we can we can make it better. But again, you know, we have to always take you know, the, the journey of these programs and, and where we are now and where we came from. Thank you, Mr. Nagash. And Ms. Tainter, do you have any thoughts you would like to share about implications for our system of humanitarian protection moving forward, given the events of this past year? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we don't have a lot of tools in our toolbox to welcome newcomers. And I think um, the one thing that we, we've definitely learned is we have more tools than we thought. Um, and we can be more creative with those tools. And so again, it's not, um, it's not an either or situation, like either with the resettlement um, sort of approach or humanitarian parole, but it is really both. Um, and so I think that is, um, that, that is what I think, you know, kind of moving forward is that, you know, we've uncovered some, some new ways of doing business and hopefully this new ways of business will just help us welcome more newcomers because as Skinder said, there are many more newcomers um, in need of safety than we welcome each and every year. And so how do we put it all on the table and make it happen and recognize the strengths of the different programs, the challenges of the different programs and try to stitch something together, which is workable, even if it's not perfect, right? I don't think anybody, anybody would say that, you know, humanitarian parole as a tool is, is perfect, but there is a 
time and a place for it. And we've sort of shown that we're able to utilize it um, for mm -hmm. the betterment of the American community, our diaspora community, our veteran communities, and communities that really care um, about, you know, forcibly displaced people uh, internationally. Thank you. And then just following up on the, the humanitarian parole um, and in and, and thinking about how thousands arrived this year and were paroled in, how will our refugee policy and integration be affected by the growing use of parole? It clearly was needed to respond immediately to immediate needs. Uh, and But how is that going to affect our, our refugee, our, our policy and integration? Uh, using parole. And then I would ask about temporary protected status. Now, temporary protected status is something that you can only receive when you're in the United States. But if we have flows in emergency like the thousands of people we have at the border that are fleeing conditions that are encompassed in the description, uh, the, the, the criteria in the statute, is that something we should be, be looking for expanding or pushing? So I'll start. So we'll start, start at the end again. At the end and go so, what I would say under this administration is, you know, the use of parole is not going to affect the refugee program because this administration is extremely committed to trying to achieve the really ambitious targets that they've set out for us. So this 125,000, um, which again will be our target this coming fiscal year, um, we will be doing everything we can to get as high as possible within that. So it is not limiting us in any way. You know, the funds that we are utilizing for the refugee resettlement program that we are providing to our partners uh, and to communities and frankly the money that that we spend overseas to help process refugees um, that that is walled off if you will from the other types of response mechanisms that have been used this last year so i think that is not in effect and again i would submit that i think again having that as a foundational program probably in a way proves confidence in some of these other measures um, to show that, in fact, we have a foundational program for, for frankly, for populations that can wait a little bit longer for protection, and then for those extreme circumstances where we have true emergencies and need to move people, then I think that's when the creativity and some of the new tools that we've used this last year um, really can play play a role. And then, frankly, you know, we we need legislation to help people adjust status once they've arrived. People can go through the asylum system. People know it's long uh, and slow. Um, perhaps it's improving, but but again, trying to create a, a more permanent status for people once they've arrived um, is is the one thing that it's not accomplished through parole, and we know that. But again, I think we have to continue to examine what the possibilities are. Thank you, Ms. Tainter. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I was listening this morning to the Clinton Global Initiative, and they were talking about um, this this morning, and the Queen of Jordan was saying, you know, we need to look through our, uh, through the windshield, not through a rearview mirror, and, I, you know, that's true. You know, we're going to continue to have more forcibly displaced folks, whether that's because of war, or whether that's because of climate migration, and so, again, how do we put all those tools on the table, understand when they're un imperfect, and try to correct them where they are? Um, I mean, you guys know um, more than most uh, of the American public that our immigration system is made up of a patchwork. Um, there are our temporary protected status, you know, there are different, there's asylum, there's all these sort of things that we throw into it and we hope that it mixes together in a way that creates permanency and safety and um, opportunity for newcomers. And so, you know, it's not, it's gonna, you know, it's not an either or, it's an and in both. And how do we, how do we recognize that, you know, where, where, what is the role that TPS can play in some of the things that we are talking about? What are the pros and cons of that? What are the things that we can throw on the table right now? What are the things that we can begin to create a future for, um, for the long term? And, you know, again, I mean, I'm just saying, you know, that, you know, it, it's really an exciting time to be part of this work because we are planning for the future. We are innovating. We are trying out new things. We are trying to, to mix it up, for the lack of a better word, and try to really move forward with um, a better way to welcome all newcomers, whether they're coming across our southern border, whether they are coming from Ukraine, whether they're coming from Afghanistan. What are the ways in which we can really, um, you know, capitalize on all the welcoming that we've seen over the past year and really create, you know, an America that works for all and an America that is prepared for the future, which is just, you know, honestly going to be more and more displacement and more and more pressure um, on our southern border and on our borders in general um, to create, you know, opportunity for those that need it. Thank you. Uh, just to, uh, to add what Larry said, I think, you know, if we decided to bring people into this country as parolees, we need also to think in terms of adjusting their status. So that's why uh, we, in my organization, a number of organizations have been advocating 
to see if there is going to be an Afghan Adjustment Act, and we have been working on that because otherwise, uh, you know, the 80,000 Afghans who came to this country, they have to adjust their status. And basically, we are saying you should apply for asylum, even though we, we for whatever reason, we put here, mm. but now you have to go through immigration process and adjust your status. Uh, the same thing with Ukraine. Again, you know, I, I don't have any objection, you know, bringing people with parole and, and you know, we have, we have immigration system, you know, for H visa, students, I mean, all kinds of things that people come to this country. But at the same time, if you made this humanitarian gesture to bring in 80,000 and probably 100,000 Ukrainians, we need also to think in terms of how quickly we can adjust their status so they can actually live, you know, their life without, you know, some interruption or waiting a, a asylum decision, you know. Uh, so I think that's, that's that's part of the challenge. I mean, we are trying our, our best to represent them because I think, in, as you, some of you know, applying for asylum in this country is not an easy thing. I mean, it's a very complicated thing. You know, you have to go through a process. It takes time. The good thing is, you know, they have employment authorization already so they can work, but it is really not very, very easy. Just in terms of TPS, um, as you know, TPS has been around since 1990. And then we have actually countries under TPS for a long period of time, mm -hmm. like El Salvador, uh, you know, a number of countries. If I'm not mistaken, that as of January 2022, we have close to 500,000 mm -hmm. TPS <laughs> granted people, and including I think the 146 is pending for two countries. So it, TPS, is, if it is going to be temporary, uh, and then it's t temporary means 20 years, uh, <laughs> then I don't know what <laughs> what temporary is going to look like. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we, we need to take into consideration some of these TPS countries are, to some extent, have a well-founded fear of persecution. Mm -hmm. That's why we decided to keep them here. But at the same time, we need to really either create a, a, a path to, for them to adjust their status rather than every 18 months they have to go through the process or mm -hmm. you know, the Homeland Security. So I, I, again, you know, that's also a, li a little bit of challenge. So I, my approach is, you know, yeah, we need to be very inclusive. You know, we need to have a policy that's fair for everybody, not a very selective uh, places that we pick people and decide and expedite the process. And somebody from El Salvador, from Honduras, been waiting for 20 years to still have to get another 18 months adjustment. So that's really some of the challenge we have. And hopefully when we discuss refugees and other issues, we'll be very inclusive again. You know, their plight is the same as the plight of other people who come into this country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nagash. And just one final question um, before we'll open up uh, our questions to the audience, for the audience. Um, given, given the huge numbers that have arrived this year and our, our effective response to those, uh, and looking at the border and the huge numbers of people along the border, millions that have come to the United States, many of whom have, have asylum claims, what role can or should refugee resettlement or refugee reception play in serving those at our border? Well, I don't think I want to answer that question. <laughs> I'm a government, I'm a, gov I'm a government official. And so I have to be very careful here. And it's really not my writ, the southern border. Mm. Um, I mean, what's, I think I'm going to pivot over to, to kind of Kit's brief, which is about reception and community inclusion and all of the various partnerships that have, I mean, as Iskander would say, they're not brand new. It's not like they have never been used before. I think this year we've seen, again, mostly because I think of the veterans community in the US, I think I give them the most credit for being front and center and forward leaning um, that has then, I think, really had a ripple on effect. So I think, you know, to me, from kind of a non-governmental side, I would say that's, I think, you know, frankly, people, this last year thought our agencies were overwhelmed. I mean, Skinner told me time and time, don't worry, you can send me more. But for the most part, we knew the agencies were, right? They, they were flat out, especially given the speed and the scale of the Afghan resettlement that we had to do once people got here, they were at military bases, but getting them off a of base be, became the next priority. And we were going flat out, and by the way, the affordable housing is pretty hard to find. Um, not just in Washington, D.C., by the way, but uh, in mm -hmm. all of this country. But, but I think 
all of that, you know, what, what we learned was there's a lot more capacity here than we knew. And except for housing, granted, th that we can't make, but all the rest of it, jobs, you know, support, you know, giving people the nurturing that, you know, Kit talked about in South Carolina, mm -hmm. that we've got that in spades. And so I think to me, and it's kind of a non-governmental response, mm -hmm. but I think that's where mm -hmm. we have kind of a um, comparative advantage, if you will, to a lot of countries, I think, because I've been around the world looking at other resettlement countries, and a lot of it is gov run by governments. I mean, really run by government, not just funded, but run. And it's like, no, we're run by communities, and we help them. But, you know, and even a skinder doesn't run resettlement because it's his communities, I'm sorry to say that, mm -hmm that really <laughs> anchor the refugees and it's the refugees themselves right because they're really good at trying to figure out what they need so i think anyway it's kind of a long-winded way of saying it but i think that's where that's where we have resilience and that's i think where we have capacity mm. thank yeah. you i mean i always think about you know if, if you're in a local community and you see a newcomer in a grocery store you you don't ask like how did you come here did you come as a refugee you know like what is your immigration status like those are questions that you don't ask like friends and families and neighbors and so at the local community they're just people they're just individuals they're just students they're just workers they're just neighbors like members of your community and so like larry's saying like a lot of the fabric of of welcoming exists no matter the immigration status that is being welcomed and so how do how do we how do we celebrate it how do we build it out? How do we sh shine the spotlight on it to, to ensure people like Larry and other folks in the government, you know, understand that we have more capacity to welcome than we thought before. You know, a lot of times, sorry, Larry, um, a lot of times, um, <laughs> you know, when, when we think about capacity, we're thinking about the capacity of, you know, certain, certain, you know, segments or certain places. And we're not thinking about the capacity of America as a whole. And if you really ask the question, like how, you know, how much can America welcome? I think we would welcome a lot more if we were thinking about welcoming as being a whole of society or even a whole of government response and not necessarily just underneath sort of a, a program at the Department of State or, you know, nine uh, refugee resettlement agencies, which do great work. I'm not saying that they don't, but, you know, just how we build that out and how we make it part of the fabric of our country. I think we would find that, that we're able to welcome people no matter their immigration status using a lot of the same tools and resources that we know um, end up in benefit not only for the newcomer, but for the communities that welcome them. So Keith, I think the best way, you know, when you go to next time to grocery store, the question is, you know, how did your ancestors came here? That, that, what, so that, that will have a much better conversation, you know, if you go to about 100 years, you know, mm. because we all assume that everybody just coming in now uh, and with forgetting that people have been coming to this country for the past 400 years. Uh, it's just a question of who is coming when, you know. Uh, I think in terms of the border, yeah, you know, I, again, you know, uh, everybody knows that Title 42 is, is a big issue. Uh, the idea of people not getting asylum uh, is, is or, or requesting asylum, you know, once they get here. I think that's that's something I think we, we should do as a country. I mean, look, you know, we have to learn also from other countries. There was a crisis in Ukraine. Russia invaded the country. Uh, you know, millions of people decided to go to Europe and... Europe said, okay, come in, you know, we, we know what's going on. Uh, and, and I think there is a lesson out of that, you know, when, when you have, uh, you, know, you know, El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras um, you have a lot of crisis with gangs and everything else, and these people are playing at gangs, and, and when you have 60,000 gang members in El Salvador alone, and, and we need to think a little bit of differently. We may, they may not have, the government may not be the one forcing them to leave, but the government is not in a position to protect them. So they're fleeing. So I think it, it's, it's in our best interest, you know, to be a little bit of welcoming of, of, of those people who are coming through the border from Mexico or other places. Uh, uh, and the other thing is, you know, look, we, we have actually in FY22 and maybe 23, we'll have more Cubans coming into to this country, mostly through Mexico. And that number is not 20,000 or 30,000, maybe 100,000 or, or more. So, but we don't actually offer the same kind of uh, welcoming because of the law we have, you know, the Haitians will be going back, but the Cubans will be admitted. I'm mm -hmm. glad we are doing that. So again, you know, this is part of the challenge we have in terms of who comes to this country and what process do they come? 
which one is welcome, which one is not, is, is part of a larger conversation we have in this country. Uh, it's part of the immigration discussion, even part of the refugee uh, discussion. I go to El Salvador all the time. You know, we have three locations we're providing service. Uh, I mean, I'm telling you that when I went to a small town called Usulutan, the police actually have to wear big masks because they are afraid. You know, the police, you know. <laughs> so imagine these children who are coming in from Central America and a company, that number is sometimes 60,000, 80,000. They have to go an immigration process here. So, so the idea that, you know, you can only be refugees if you are coming from, you know, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, is just not a very good way of really responding to humanitarian concern. That's, that's the way I see it. So we need to think in terms of how we deal with people coming in from the border, through the border. Uh, with, you know, we had about 1,500 Ukrainians who came into Tijuana, Mexico. Yeah, and we let them in, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, then we have, you know, 20,000 Haitians and others stuck there in Tijuana. There's no way, I mean, they see San Diego, but they're, they're, they're still waiting for the process to, to help them. So it's a, a little bit of a challenge, uh, but I think, um, I think there's a lot of history, there is a lot of experience. Um, you know, we, the system in mean, American people has been very, very generous. Mm. I believe Larry, correct me, in 1989, I think we, have, we resettled 200,000 refugees under the first Bush. Yeah, 207,000. So the American people are always willing to, to, you know, to, to help us resettle refugees or welcoming refugees. Uh, but I think, as, as Keith said, you know, we have to engage them. You know, they should know. They, they should have understanding who's coming because they, there is schools or there is healthcare system that, that people will need. Uh, but overall, historically looking at, we have a very, very generous welcoming refugees uh, communities in this country. And I'm, I'm one of them who received that benefit uh, when I came to this country over 40 years ago. So I know firsthand. Uh, that American people are welcome. In fact, I was, I was resettled in a stone mountain, Georgia, 40 <laughs> years ago. So if you don't know that. <laughs> so, so you're yeah, welcome. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That was a rich response. So now, folks, we're, gonna, we're going to open up, um, open up for questions. So please come to the mics with your questions. Hello. Oh. You've been trying really hard. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Can you hear me now? Um, so this last part of the discussion, I think, is really important, relevant, and since part of this conference is about policy, I wanted to, to bring this up. I mean, our asylum and refugee processes are kind of two sides of the same coin. And yet, as you correctly point out, to many Americans, they see them completely differently. Um, and a lot of it, uh, my understanding, I think, in looking at polling and listening to focus groups is, one is organized and, and done by the government in a orderly way, and the other is people arriving on their own in a disorderly way. And that, that affects how they, how they receive how they receive people, how they, how they see them, even if they're coming, as you said, Mr. Nagash, from very similar situations. So one thing I wonder is that, at least in the last decade or more, our refugee resettlement program for the Americas has been relatively small compared to lots of other places in the world. And yet that is where the majority, mostly still, the majority of asylum seekers are coming from, looking to the next, uh, de you know, allotment 125,000 so we hear um, we know in the LA declaration there was some working how can we work with other countries in the hemisphere to maybe expand availability to look at refugee resettlement more broadly Mr. Bartlett what can you tell us about those efforts I'm glad you pivoted from asylum to actually going back to refugee processing so I can actually <laughs> try to answer part of that so um, so what's interesting is, I, I, I don't know, I've worked for at least four administrations, maybe five. Every single one of them cares deeply about the Southwest border. Surprise, surprise, right? Mm -hmm. And what can we do to 
first of all, create conditions so that people don't need to come here. Okay, that is a long-term solution. Um, and what can we do kind of proactively to bring people affirmatively from uh, their country so that they don't have to make the dangerous journey? It is a well-worn phrase. Um, and that we can actually provide benefits and, and the kind of the, the regularity that refugee processing provides. So um, this administration, like the last, I will tell you, um, has been very uh, interested to see what we can do on the State Department side, and of course we do it in concert with DHS, to process more refugees from the region. That said, it is, um, it, it, it has complexities that we have nowhere else in the world. And the reason is because we're trying to identify, I mean, if, especially when you're looking at Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, we're looking at people who are still in their country of nationality. And so in a typical refugee um, identification process, people will cross an international border, UNHCR will be involved, they will do registration, maybe they'll do some assistance, and then either immediately or usually over time, people will be identified for vulnerability reasons and then resettled or referred for resettlement. As Skinder said, you know, it's less than 1% of the world's refugees are ever resettled, right? But believe me, if we could identify, we would resettle 100% of the refugees in the three Northern Triangle countries if we could identify who they are. But trying to figure out who's a refugee while they're still in their country is really complicated. So we've been working for a number of years with UNHCR and kind of a host of local NGOs to refer people who have refugee characteristics and vulnerabilities to our program. It is, it is uh, both slow but also small. And, the, and it's frustrating for, I think, everybody involved. Um, so I don't, there's not, I mean, we have given additional funding to both the UNHCR and now we're going to actually be providing some money to some US-based NGOs to do some additional identification of possible refugee cases. Uh, I will tell you, not all of them have great claims, so that a number wash out as well in the process. The other thing that we're doing, and this is part of the calculus, I think, around the LA delegation uh, declaration, is to look at other populations in the region. So we know, for example, Nicaraguans, they are a more classic refugee population where they actually have fled, um, and they're in other countries, and so we are uh, going to be, well, we've started already, but we will be scaling up a program for Nicaraguans. And then we've worked hard with UNHCR over the last year to create a real program for Venezuelans. You know, the, for those people who know that situation, the, the hosting, kind of like Skinner talked about with Ukrainians in Europe, uh, a lot of countries do a really great job in terms of, you know, in the region hosting Venezuelans. But we have determined, and I think, you know, we were pushing hard for this, um, that it's now time to really look hard at resettlement. And so we're providing additional funding to UNHCR for both for Venezuelans and Nicaraguans. So you will see the numbers from the region expand, but I don't think we've really cracked the code yet as to how to do volume out of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And I'm not sure we will, but believe me, we continue to look at that. And then before I take my next question from the audience, but please come up to the mic. I'm going to take a, a question from, from our um, virtual folks. And this is specifically for you, Kit. How many US homes took in Ukrainians and Afghans? A question for Kit. That's a great question. And you can see me trying to do arithmetic in my head and I'm going, uh, not going to get there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, about 55,000 Ukrainians have arrived. So, um, you know, how that translates into the numbers of families that have taken Ukrainians in, um, I can't do great math, but I would divide that by four and sort of assume that that's probably true. Um, Larry, I don't know if you know the numbers for the private sponsorship for off the top of your head. The, yeah, I, what I would say on the, on the Afghan side is, you see, it's yeah, all trying it's, to do math. It's fairly, <laughs> no, it's fairly small because, you know, we, we did start up a program called um, Sponsor Circles. Mm -hmm. And I want to say it's 300 families, maybe, that were supported through Sponsor Circles. It's, it's something that we're trying to pivot off of to really create a private sponsorship program. But again, it'll be rather nascent this year in terms of numbers. But again, I think it's, it's an important concept. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, while it's really important to think about the number of households that have taken newcomers in, I always think about, like, what is the constellation of support that's around those households? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there was a Ukrainian family that was sponsored um, by a family in Wyoming, and, you know, their Wyoming hasn't had a refugee resettlement program ever. Um, and so just the idea that you would have, you know, a family that, you know, has neighbors, that has a church community, that has friends, that has, you know, other family members that live in those local communities, like, how does that radiate out um, from that particular household? You know, how does that radiate? Out, radiate out in social media that shares a different story about a newcomer that I think is really key, especially in, you know, communities that um, might be politically disinclined to support immigrants. And then how does that sort of radiate out in that community itself? And um, and so that's what I always think about is like, how do you create those ripple effects that really th that change our, our hearts and minds over the long term that in effect help us change policy because you ch can't change policy unless the people will it. And so how do we get to the people to will it? Perfect. Thank you. And our next question. Oh, it's from the virtual world. Um, oh, no, it's your, your turn. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, I'm my name is Andrea Ilardia, and I work uh, in a high school here in, uh, in Prince William County. Uh, one of the um, cases that we have usually is with the families after they're arriving and they're trying to enroll in the school. And then we find out there's different situations going on. One of them are the students that come from Afghanistan with other parents and accompanied. And then the release to a sponsor who supposedly is a relative. After that happened, many, many cases, the sponsor leaves the students in another house by themselves. We don't know about it. And we find out later that it's a student for three months that never attended the school, they never had been enrolled, and they don't have even basic documentation. We have cases where kids, there were three students, they didn't have a way to provide for themselves, no medical, nothing. Finally, uh, Catholic Charities was able to help us to enroll them in the program, um, you know, and get all the paperwork, but it took six months, seven months. So my first question is, what type of follow-up uh, the Refugee Resettlement Office does for that kind of cases? That's my first question. My second question is regarding the students that come to the country without parents from the south of the border, from El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Guatemala. They come fleeing poverty, abuse, many cases, sexual abuse. They come to the border, they go to the office of resettlement, refugee and resettlement, they're released to a sponsor who's supposed to be a relative, and the relative later say, oh, I cannot deal with this anymore. I wash my hands and they leave the kids by themselves or with someone else. They go from house to house. In the meantime, these students don't have any type of documentation. They may be eligible to apply for a juvenile uh, a visa, a special visa, but of course, they may be 16, 17, almost 18, or by the time that they can apply, they are already 18, they cannot do it because the juvenile court, oh, they don't know what they have to do. I have asked them many times, what paper they gave you? It's just a piece of paper that says, we release it to a sponsor. That's it. That's the only thing they have. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. These students don't have medical attention, we have to find ways to get them the attention they need, but they don't have a guardian. They don't have nobody to sign for them. It is any way that for these students, they can be qualified. I don't know, maybe in the future, something that the refugee program can think, they put them as a type of refugee. They, it's not their fault what they're going through, why they need to have it more harder. You have to see their faces. It is heartbreaking. Thank you. So I want to start with a, a little bit of that, but then it's really brilliant that Iskinder used to be the director of ORR, so he's going to be on the hook for some of this. I can tell you. Um, used to be. You know what's interesting? What's interesting? You know, there's a whole bunch of threads in that, and um, and they're really important. And and one of them is, you know, there's this um, again for people who are students of the refugee program, you'll know this ongoing debate about the kind of professionalization of refugee resettlement and, you know, love it or hate it. And, you know, it's been federalized and, you know, we fund agencies like USCRI and, you know, we've gotten away from communities and, you know, the people that Kit works with. I mean, it, it's a whole, it's a whole smorgasbord of stuff, right? And, and none of them are, are the best, right? They're, they're, they all work well. They best work best when they're, they're worked together. So, you know, as we're looking at, you know, we did community sponsor circles, and now we're going to be community sponsorship, private sponsorship, pilot. You know, one of the concerns that we have, of course, is what happens 
if sponsors don't follow through because we can't let people slip. We can't just say, you know, wash our hands, and I heard this in the example, give people a piece of paper and say, good luck, mm -hmm. right? And so it's one of the reasons that we're taking a little bit of time trying to put together um, a private sponsorship program, which, which frankly will be only partial anyway because we still want people to receive federal benefits. So we're still trying to work out how all of that will work, but we do need accountability. And so we're not, and frankly, we don't have enough um, staffing, frankly, or infrastructure in the government. So we're going to have to contract some of that out, but then we'll hold our contractors accountable um, to make sure other people are accountable. So that, to me, is always going to be imperative, you know, as we build out additional. I mean, a number of our agencies have brilliant relationships, you know, not just with faith based organizations, but other groups um, who, for, you know, decades helped refugees. But there still has to be accountability. And that's why at this point in time, it's still our federally funded partners that we make accountable. They can use as many other sponsors as they want. But at the end of the day, when something goes badly, they need to be there to pick up the pieces and make it right. So I don't know, on the other side, asylum, I, I'm sure you have some yeah. thoughts. So I think even the refugee program, when you have an accompanying minors, we have actually a program that since 1978 was called URM, Unaccompanied Refugee Minors. So if they are actually admitted as parolee, they are entitled to the same extent as refugees. So we do have, uh, I'm not sure about that case, but we do have a system where these children will be in private home, like a foster care system. Depending on the state, they will be emancipated in some places, it's 21. In fact, post emancipation there is also services so for the refugee program if they came in as without without a parent unaccompanied we have actually a very good system around the country uh, some of them as private foster care system uh, hhs fund them fully uh, so that's the way the system yeah, but once in a while you may have some kids um, you know uh, fall from the cracks uh, but uh, we have they have that system in the in the uh, company minors you know once you are released from uh, or custody or what once you're released to uh, a family member there is actually a wide expanded uh, uh, program what we call it is post release services so the kids are released there is a follow-up case management services there is a lot of home visits that they do. And, and as you know, in this country, uh, for elementary and high school under Title I, uh, there is no immigration status uh, in terms of going to school. But the question is, somebody has to take them, somebody mm -hmm. do the vaccine and all kind of follow up. So even with all the challenges we have, is sometimes you know we get up, up to 130,000 unaccompanied minors per year. There is a system, at least uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is trying to do post-release services, which is if every client they will be going, they will be checking uh, the condition. If if the system is not working, I mean, if, if the sponsor is not providing the basic services, you know, the HHS has a right to take them uh, and, and put them in different uh, situations. So it, it's not a, per, a perfect system, but the system is here in terms of follow-up service for unaccompanied minors, uh, mostly coming from El Salvador, Guatemala, and El Salvador. For the refugee program, if they are coming uh, without a, a family member, there is a program called URM. It's actually in, in a lot of states. Uh, it's like a for, foster care system, but it's fully funded. And depending on the state's uh, requirement, whether they will be emancipated at 21, in some places, maybe 18, but most of them are do get a lot of services. They go to school. Uh, they get the same kind of benefit like any other refugees who is admitted to the U.S., even more. Thank you. Thank you. Just one quick question from our virtual audience, and then we'll take yours. Uh, will refugees from climate disruptions be prioritized for resettlement? And I, wow, I, I, I love these questions. Um, <laughs> So it's interesting, I was at a conference in Geneva this summer, and this was one of the topics that people were talking about. And, you know, there's a lot of words around this, you know, are they climate refugees? Are they refugees affected by climate change? I think we would um, probably espouse the latter. And, I, and the discussions that we're having within the administration and with UNHR is, is to look at that as, I think, another indicator of resettlement need. 
And so again, just as people have, I mean, it's a legitimate protection need if, if the climate situation in your country of first asylum is affecting you. So it, it will be, it will be put, I think, in the basket of priorities, but you know, like a lot of other things, it will have to be measured against the other ones that we have. Okay, thank you. And we'll take one more question from our audience here, and then we're gonna to have to wrap up. But please feel free after to come up and speak with the, with the panelists if they have time. I just came back from Ukraine and uh, all the local stakeholders, local politicians, local NGOs are expecting a humanitarian disaster during the winter. In light of that, are there any predictions of how many people are going to come next year? Well, I'll start and then Kit will correct me. Um, <laughs> You know, there's a couple different things that are going on, at least in terms of the refugee program for Ukrainians. Because again, the administration, I think, for for especially for speed and efficiency, pivoted towards parole, right? But we we still maintain a refugee resettlement program for Ukrainians, and that's coming through the Lautenberg program, so religious minorities who have family members in the U.S. And we've on the State Department side, the um, the center that that actually operates that for us, which is run by IOM used to be in Kyiv, obviously is not right now, but we have offices, um, satellite offices now in Moldova as well as Poland. And so we are processing um, kind of as quickly as possible Ukrainians who are in our system, so they will be coming, which actually, I don't know, I think it's the fourth largest population we have so far this year. Um, we'll continue to accelerate, I think, those cases Sorry, they're two, four, six, six largest. We'll continue to accelerate those cases, but so far we have not seen Ukrainians in need of U.S. resettlement coming through any of the mechanisms that we've been able to identify. So either working with UNHCR, working with European partners, Ukrainians up to now have really wanted to shelter in place, partly because a lot of the men are still back in Ukraine. Um, and really want to stay as close as possible to the border. So again, we're ready and we're, I think we're prepared to provide a larger response in terms of actual resettlement, but we so far have not seen the, the need. Yeah, I think it's you know important to recognize that, you know, Larry's talking about sort of the formal refugee resettlement program, and then you have Uniting for Ukraine, which is the humanitarian parole program. And so, you know, I think um, your point is well taken and well understood um, that the, the situation continues to grow um, and get more complex the longer that it goes along. And so how does winter begin to affect those movements? How does you know the cessation of supportive services in Poland begin to affect somebody's desire to come to the United States, even if their family is still in Ukraine? Really trying to keep our finger on the pulse of that. You know, President Biden said, you know, that uh, the goal was 100,000 Ukrainians, about 50% to that goal, but that's not a ceiling, that's not a maximum. Um, you know, we're hopeful that um, a lot of the successes um, of the program can and continue um, over the next, you know, six months, you know, 12 months, 18 months, however long it takes um, for, for the situation in Ukraine to not only like stabilize, but be a place that you could go home to as a family. And so one of the things that we are tracking along with our partners at the Department of Homeland Security is that the situation has changed, you know, where maybe a, maybe six months ago you thought, yeah, I can go to the United States. It's temporary. I'll be able to come home in six months. Now it's not. And now families are really looking at where do I need to rebuild my life? Is it in Poland really close to where um, Ukraine is so I can, you know, see my husband from time to time? Or am I really ready to start over a whole um, and come to the United States and really hope that that, um, that temporary temporary status changes into a permanent status so that I can build a life here with my kids. And so it's just a, such a dynamic situation. And again, like we are so fortunate to have the vehicle of Uniting for Ukraine um, to complement the refugee resettlement program, um, to know that it is imperfect, but know that it also at the end of the day offers people safety, sanctuary, health insurance, you know, work authorization, all those things that people really need um, to start their lives here. So thanks for the question. It's such a good one. Uh, just to add, uh, I, I agree with everything they said in terms of Ukrainian, but I just wanted to say this. Uh, so when you do the advocacy work also, you take into consideration, we have still refugees. Uh, we have refugees since 1968, refugee camp. Mm. Uh, we have refugees in the DAP since 1991. We have refugees since 1975. We have actually Rohingya refugees. Mm. 
also. So I think, you know, I, you know, look, you know, we have to do everything that we can to support the Ukrainian and Afghan, but we have this protracted refugee situation also around the globe. You know, 1968, a refugee camp, still waiting. Hopefully, somebody will consider them. You know, so keep in mind, you know, you know this discussion again. You know, we are reacting to the the current events, you know, the, the headlines, but there are also other refugees. I mean, the Rohingyas are going through a very difficult situation, not necessarily snow, but flooding has been infecting them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have Eritrean refugees in Sudan since 1968, maybe not snow, but it's 115 degree <laughs> heat they have been living there. So when we talk about refugees, and, and I think try to be very, very uh, inclusive and take into consideration we do have other refugees also globally who need our protection. Thank you. And with that, we are, we've reached the end of our panel. I want to thank you all, the audience virtually and in person, for attending our 19th annual Immigration Law and Policy Conference. One of our objectives today was to get folks thinking and talking. Um, today's speakers inspired us to look at different perspectives to start small if necessary, to start where we can and look way for ways to dialogue and work together. I think they hit it out of the park, folks. I think they did a great job. So in ending, I do want to make sure to thank MPI, who were the leaders this year in organizing and presenting the conference, all the staff of MPI, um, also Georgetown Law School, of course, and clinic staff as well for the work done to make this important conference happen. So thank you so much, folks, for your attention and your heart. Thank you.